Send, a Canadian-Hungarian author has said, being a philosopher, I have a problem for every solution. Oh, the joys of philosophy. Good afternoon, I'm Ashima, and this is a talk about little things. When I was in ninth grade, I started a new school in a new country. I was barely getting the hang of being a teenager, so when I suddenly found myself in high school, being the socially awkward person that I am, I decided to be really quiet and just read a lot. Reading had always been a sort of escape for me, a way to forget the real, everything messy about the real world and live at Hogwarts. I mean, I'm still waiting for my letter, Hogwarts admission department. But as always, things didn't go as I planned. They never do. I made friends with this really cheery girl whose name I couldn't remember for like the whole day I was with her. But slowly, I got the hang of things. The three of us became inseparable. I loved my English teacher because he was playful and recognized how much I loved to read, and I joined theater and realized how much I loved being at the center of attention. And the whole year flew by, and I couldn't wait to learn more in 10th grade. And that summer, the day I was flying back to India to be with my family, a terrorist attack happened a street away from home. I remember reaching our house in Kolkata late at night, unable to sleep or think, we stayed up till three watching the news. That day, everything changed. My English and theater teachers left school. I didn't see them walking in the hallways anymore. A lot of students left too. And I found myself surrounded by silence and half-empty hallways. We all pretended that nothing had changed, but I was hurting and I didn't understand. Theoretically, I knew people could do atrocious things to others. But here it was, happening in real life. Two alumni from my school had died that day. I began to question everything. If humans were capable of this, what other lines were they willing to cross? How did we come to decide ethics and morals as societies? Were humans intrinsically selfish? And down this rabbit hole I went, thinking about the insignificance of our existence. Death was inevitable, so why do we bother doing anything? Everything ended one day, which made me think, how come some things are alive at all? Where does life come from? And soon I found myself believing that humans were so, so very insignificant. We craved control in this infinite cosmos where not even our own emotions, our bodies, were truly in our control. Weren't our emotions just a product of our biological processes? Weren't we so minuscule to the larger universe that nothing we ever did could leave an impression of our existence? We were alive for mere seconds on that grand cosmic scale. Our, our false sense of superiority was just a testament to our narcissism as people. What I didn't know was that I had gone from being an, a hopeless romantic to an existential nihilist. Life ceased to have meaning for me, and I lost myself. And in the pits of existential dread and total despair, I went back to that initial plan of mine. Be quiet and read a lot, I told myself. So I became quiet and I read. Children's War Diaries, Lord of the Flies, The Catcher in the Rye, The Kite Runner. There was never a moment I didn't have a book by my side. I craved that escape. I craved to be someplace else because I didn't like the reality anymore. I didn't know who I was, and I didn't know why we mattered. So I would think about my childhood, when I was happy and the world was beautiful. And as Dodi, one of my favorite musicians, has put it, Memories were painted in much brighter ink. They tell me I loved, teach me how to think. That childhood seems so far now, so out of reach. I wondered how I could have been so oblivious to this inescapable darkness. And I remembered the inexhaustible source of light that shone so very brightly, a book you may know as The Little Prince. It was one of the first books I ever remember reading, and ever since, I fell in love with stories. It taught me how to talk to my plants, like the little prince did to his rose. It made me dream I could fly, and it told me that stars were my friends. That seems so distant now, so naive. But since my mission was to read everything I could get my hands on, I decided to read it again. 
For those of you who don't know, this story is about the narrator and his journey from childhood into adulthood. As a child, awestruck by a book about wild animals, the narrator draws a picture, and he goes around asking adults if they're frightened by it, and he always gets the same reply. Why should anyone be frightened by a hat? But you see, what he had drawn was not a hat. It was a boa constrictor in the act of swallowing an elephant. So to explain this, he drew another picture. Grown-ups always need explaining. But they told him to put aside art and focus on arithmetic. So he does. And he grows up to become a pilot whose plane crashes in the Sahara Desert, where in the middle of nowhere, he meets the little prince. The Little Prince comes from asteroid B612, and after traveling through the universe, arrives at Earth. He insists the pilot draw him a sheep. And when the Little Prince wants something, you cannot deny him. So, the narrator draws him the only picture he knows how to draw. And the Little Prince exclaims, I don't want an elephant inside a boa constrictor. Elephants are cumbersome creatures, and a boa constrictor is very dangerous. What I need is a sheep. Draw me a sheep. After many failed attempts, he hurriedly draws a little box and says the sheep is inside. And the little prince is ecstatic. This is exactly the way he wanted it. Teary-eyed and smiling, I understood two things that day. All of us were living in our own isolated Sahara deserts. And all of us had our own elephants and boa constrictors. We spent our whole life learning arithmetic and geography when all we needed was someone who would understand what we had drawn. But alas, I too had grown up. I couldn't see sheep inside drawings of boxes anymore. Over the course of the novel, the little prince reveals that he has a rose that he loves. The rose has told him she's the only one of her kind and he has never seen anything more beautiful. But on his first day on Earth, he walks by a garden of roses and is devastated. She was supposed to be the only one of her kind. And he befriends a fox who tells him, if you tame me, it will be as if the sun came to shine on my life. I shall know the sound of a step that will be different from all others. The grain, which is golden like your hair, will bring me back the thought of you, and I shall love to listen to the wind and the wheat. And when the little prince passes by the roses again, he tells them, you are not at all like my rose. My rose alone is more important than the hundred of you other roses, because it is she that I have watered, because it is she that I have put under the glass globe, because it is she that I have listened to, because she is my rose. That afternoon, I talked to my friends whose voices would bring a smile to my face, to my family, whose steps and breaths sounded different than all the rest. That day, I realized that, sure, we were alive for mere seconds on that grand cosmic scale, but we live in the minuscule world around us. And this world is brimming with life. And even if nothing we do matters, isn't it beautiful to, we can, how to, we can spend an afternoon laughing in the park with friends? Isn't it marvelous to wake up every morning and see your mother smile? And isn't that laughter and tears we share enough? When I was asked to give a talk and given a speaker's guide, it said I had to be an expert on my topic. I'm not an expert in philosophy, or nor in literature. I'm possibly an expert in having an inexplicably large number of existential crises per day. But what I believe we're all experts in is feeling. All we ever need to do to make meaning in this infinite cosmos is to try to understand someone's drawing of a boa constrictor, swallowing an animal. After all, our identity is shaped by that love. When the little prince finally left, he told the narrator to look up at the stars because he would always hear them laugh back to him. And I promise to you, even if it all seems meaningless and empty, look up at the stars and know they will always laugh back to you. Perhaps that is the meaning of our lives. Thank you.